to our first Friday Forum today. I'm Diana Martin. I'm the executive director here at Hourglass, and I am thrilled to be joined by Phil Wenger, the president of the Lancaster Conservancy, and Fritz Schroeder, the senior vice president of Community Impact. Um, they are joining us today, actually, as they kick off Lancaster Water Week, which starts today. Uh, they're going to tell us a little bit more about that event, and I recommend while you're downtown, if you guys haven't seen the amazing Water Week installation in, in the square today that you definitely check it out because it's pretty remarkable. So um, today we're going to hear more about the Conservancy's new uh, $21 million campaign that they just launched to protect and restore our natural lands. And when Hourglass was founded 25 years ago, um, land use has been a really important issue to Hourglass. So we've been concerned about how we can grow as a county, but still protect the things that make us unique, which are our natural lands. And I'm really excited to hear more about what the Conservancy is doing with that today. So thank you so much, Fritz. And Great work in the community. And we're just really excited to share uh, our passions for conservation. And uh, as Diana said, it's the kickoff to Water Week. So uh, happy Water Week, everyone. For the next uh, 10 days, we're going to be celebrating clean water in Lancaster County. And I think we're all very aware at this point of the challenges we face around our 1,400 miles of streams and rivers here in Lancaster. Nearly half of them are polluted or impaired. Um, and we are the number one contributor of nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment to the Susquehanna River and in turn the Chesapeake Bay. So there's a lot, uh, there's a lot, there's a big bullseye on Lancaster County's uh, back as far as cleaning up those streams and rivers. And the municipalities and elected officials are really starting to take action. And there's a lot that's happening in our communities. But uh, when we launched Water Week six years ago, it was really about rallying the rest of us. It's about what we can all do to uh, really create change, uh, and, it, and it really starts with our own personal properties. So we have um, action steps that we promote to the community, uh, and the first one is create habitat, and it's thinking about what you can do on your own property uh, and how that translates then to, into your neighborhood and then into your broader community. Uh, and so uh, we have over 20 events happening this week. Uh, ben Weber, who's sitting to my right, is hosting the History of the Conestoga number three. This is his third uh, year of doing the History of the Conestoga presentation. That'll be at Lancaster History on uh, Tuesday evening. We're doing trivia at Sickman's Mill, if anyone wants to come down and have a Cricker Creek beer by the Chickies Creek and play trivia with us on Thursday night. But then there's a ton of educational information uh, ton of educational opportunities. There's action-oriented events happening throughout the week. And there's paddles happening on the Conestoga River. Uh, we have great partners. And this is really a celebration of all the work that is happening throughout the year and motivating all of us to get more involved, to make this a huge community-wide initiative. And then, as Diana mentioned, we did a public art installation with the help of uh, our very good friends at Nimblest as well as Atomic and Tate. And that is a pollinator wall on the left-hand side with the Susquehanna River running down through it. Uh, so the pollinator wall is there. It's in the Fulton Bank quadrant of Penn Square. And it's a four-sided structure with educational information on all four sides. There are opportunities to take home your own pollinator seeds to plant in your garden. And just great opportunities to learn more about the action steps that I was just talking about. Uh, and just a fun way to engage the community. We'll be down there this, uh, this evening for First Friday giving away free trees free native plants uh, and free native seeds. And then all our partners are going to be there, too. So we welcome you to come down. If you have any questions for me afterwards, there's a brochure out there that has all our events. And just thank you for giving me some time to, to talk about clean water. Now I'm going to turn it over to our president, Phil Wanger. Phil joined us six years ago. I've been with the organization for 10 years. And he likes to say we went from this sleepy nonprofit that not many people really knew about. Some of us knew about the Conservancy, but many didn't. Uh, and he brought his entrepreneurial spirit to our organization, right? 30 plus years of developing restaurants and running Isaacs and turning it into this big success. He brought that entrepreneurial spirit to our organization. And we put a really great team together that we're proud of. and. Um, and launch this incredible campaign. And so he's just gonna kick us off and then we're gonna go back and forth from there. Hey, thanks for that introduction. I appreciate it. It has been a really fun uh, second career for me to come to the Conservancy and bring that energy that I still had to contribute back to the community and to find an organization whose time was just ripe 
for what we're trying to accomplish in this community. You know, when I arrived, we had had a lot of fearless leaders who were primarily volunteer driven who brought us to this point. So folks like Bill Ebel and his history and tradition with the Conservancy uh, has made a huge contribution to this organization. And, you know, we ended up coming in and just elevating everything by increasing our funding privately and publicly, bringing in higher level of professionalism. And we sort of took this sleepy nonprofit into a real professional organization that's accomplishing an awful lot in this community. But for those that really don't know who we are, uh, I just I need to give that little primer lesson. Because we were formed at approximately the same time as what the Farmland Trust was. And uh, we are 50 years old a couple of years ago when this slide was made and we started thinking about this campaign. But we've been around the same length of time as the Farmland Trust. And there are two organizations that really are focused on preserving the, the, the Lancaster landscape. The Farmland Trust is amazing. They've set their model compared to everybody in the nation and successfully now have preserved over 120,000 acres. They use an easement model. All 120,000 acres there are all privately owned. They can be privately sold. They are protected from development and they are protecting both our landscape and an agriculture industry and they are very, very politically popular. What the Conservancy does as sort of the other bookend of that is we end up going out and finding special places that should not be developed who have a very high natural score, who have streams and springs, who have outlooks on the river, or who are mostly forested or have a high natural area score. And we too say that these lands should not be developed, but what we do differently is we actually acquire them and we manage them for public benefit, which means most of our lands, almost 8,200 acres are open to the public and they are open for fishing, for hunting, and for recreation, and for escaping into nature. So we have the foot trails on our lands. Our lands are often along the big rail trails that we have and they're quite popular. And so our mission is to provide these forested lands and clean waterways for our community forever because most natural lands get a higher score if they're connected to the clean water movement in this community and the clean water lands. And so this is a little bit back to that farmland trust, but you'll notice on here a bunch of names, including like Amos Funk, who gets credit for starting the farmland trust. Well, he was also a founder of this. Because we have two separate organizations, each focused on their own area, we have been more successful in protecting our landscape than many other communities. And we're working a lot in York, which I'll talk about a little bit later. And there they have one organization, does easements only, conservation easements, does farmland easements. And they haven't gotten anywhere near what we've been able to accomplish here in Lancaster County by having two potent organizations. And it's been really fun. So this land trust goes and acquires lands. You know, we have a scoring system, we raise the money, we buy them, and then once we own them, we have a responsibility to them for recreation, so managing those trails and parking lots. But for our board, restoration actually trumps recreation. So what in the world are the ecological characteristics of attractive land, and what do we contribute back to the loss of habitat of bees and birds? What do we contribute to clean water? What do we bring to the table and use those restoration projects? So we have an edible forest along the Northwest River Trail. It's a learning opportunity. We have you know, streams we've redeveloped at Climbers Run. We do a lot of that kind of thing. But the bottom line, and the, what makes us unique, private organization, public lands. And we've been very successful. You know, I will tell you, we have 8,200 acres now of natural land and 50 nature preserves. Does anybody here know how many acres there are in county parks? The huge county park down here, the one up at Welsh Mount, and the one at Speedwell? 2,100 acres. So just by comparison, we are now four times larger owner of public lands in this region. Now, some of these 8,200 acres are along the Susquehanna and York County, so I'm not just contrasting Lancaster County, but about 2,800 of those acres are in York County. But that's what we do. And so this is a huge responsibility, burden, but an opportunity because we look for those opportunities to protect natural lands. So we have 45 miles of trails for recreation. Our employers are using that to try and attract more people to come and work here as opposed to go to Colorado Springs where you can actually escape on places like the Conestoga Trail and do a long 15 mile hike without seeing anybody else. And of course we have these streams we keep talking about. We focus on the wooded areas along the streams and we have all these trees. 
And trees are going to be the new commodity. And you know we're dealing with carbon, we're dealing with carbon sequestration, we're dealing with all the benefits of trees. You know, there are folks in this room who are scientists who understand the value of trees, but we now own more acreage and trees than anybody else in all of Lancaster County, more than state parks and game lands. And it's just a remarkable opportunity for us to look at these ecosystems that exist in forested areas and continue to promote them. So all that said is we are at a time now that we believe is a huge tipping point for this community. And there's two drivers of this. One, not everybody believes but it is true, and that is our planet is in peril. We are seriously, seriously eroding the natural world that runs and drives the systems that we depend on for modern life. And so that natural world in peril brings a youthful audience. It, we're gonna have Fritz go through some of the details and then we'll answer questions about that for you. So I think what we have is an eight minute film here and some of you who are at our announcement right here in the Ware Center saw this, and so you can go on your phone and do something else, but it's really compelling. <laughs> and it's the voices of the quality leadership we have at the Conservancy at this point. We have built a really amazing team, and uh, you get to hear them talk and not hear me talk, so. For the Conservancy, Protect and Restore is sort of a once in a generation campaign. And we are coming at folks asking for them to make an investment in our future. Our future as a planet, our future as a community, and our future as a species. The Protect and Restore ecology, you can't have one without the other. They're completely tied together like a spider web. When you sit here at House Rock Overlook along the Susquehanna River and you look out across to York County, so much of the land you see is protected by the Conservancy. And much of it's only been protected very recently. And there's still a lot more to protect over there. But anytime you sit at one of these overlooks over the Susquehanna River, you can get a sense of the way these dis disparate parcels are interconnected. Right now, the real estate market is booming. We've all seen that over the last couple of years. If you've tried to buy a home or have seen somebody try to buy a home, it's the same thing for land protection. The market is so quick that if we don't have our resources lined up on the get-go, we're going to lose the property. In a lot of ways, the land we protect starts in a disadvantaged place, whether it's been improperly managed in agricultural practices, whether it's been partially developed in the past, or whether it's just not been managed with the most contemporary, or whether it's just not been managed with the most contemporary. But I have cognizantly chosen this place as my home and to raise my family. So the work that I'm proud to do is to clean that up, but then to make it resilient as well. That's difficult. It's just going to take all in all a lot of the modern challenges that we're facing. I think that for folks that don't take the time or have the experience or don't familiarize themselves with that experience of nature, it's easy to miss out on what an important part of our soul that is. That connection to the natural world and being a part of that harmonic system. We depend on nature. We don't survive if nature doesn't survive. We are nature and nature is us, and we've forgotten that, right? So there's very what have you done for me lately kinds of reasons why we need to make sure the next generation understands the importance of protecting open space. Climbers Run Nature Center is located about 20 minutes outside of Lancaster City on Frogtown Road. It's a preserve that we've owned for 10 years. We have this beautiful barn. We've got a wonderful wetland, pond, and pristine trout stream all within close proximity to the barn, which makes it ideal for educating people of all ages and mobilities. Partnerships are a key part of Lancaster Conservancy's success and the success of Climbers Run Nature Center. We invite nonprofit partners, schools, summer camps, community. A lot of money, but it is a lot of money to buy land and to take care of it and to and bring the public to it so they can enjoy it as well. And with this money, we're in a better position to do so. Let's say we're working on this $11 million project and we're just kind of moving along through the pace, doing really well. And all of a sudden over here, this incredible second project comes up and it moves quickly. It has to move faster. How are we going to fund that? Only through this Protect and Restore campaign can we do things like that. One of the things I really love about the Conservancy is they take 
the long view. And so when we protect land, we protect it forever. For every property that we acquire, we set money aside into an endowment to care for that land. Endowment for an organization is critical to the long-term survival of an organization like the Conservancy if there is economic downturns or if government grants ever went away. We all come into this planet, we all come into this life with a need to make a mark that will last long-term. For me personally, I love nature. I love the outdoors. I love the way it feeds my soul. And I don't want us as a human family to lose that experience. We have the, the momentum and then we have the, the market right now. The market is crazy. We have so many properties that are coming up that we've been having our eye on for, for years and years and we're finally getting the opportunity to protect them. So now is more important than ever. The future is an uncertain thing. The things that we feel confident about is that the pressures of development in this local area are gonna continue. And the one thing we know is a certainty is that the amount of land is not going to increase. So one thing we're very confident of is that those pressures are gonna collide and that the work we're doing in protecting the land has a limited time frame to be done. This is the future of our community. If, you know, I think of the canoe track that we got, that could have been a warehouse. That was gonna be a warehouse. You can't take that back. Once that warehouse is there, it stays warehouse. Once the subdivision goes in, it stays subdivision. And the clock is ticking on this land, right? We're in a race to protect as much of the, the land as we can. And we're not anti-development, but we gotta be doing it in the right places in the right way. And what we do is we protect the places where development shouldn't happen. It's really leaving a legacy for future generations that future generations will come back and look, look upon our donors now at this really critical time in history. And I think be very grateful for the gifts that people gave them, the gift of open space. History of this is that we turned 53 years ago, and uh, right, you know, right as the pandemic hit, we were we were looking to move forward with the public or move forward with the campaign, and then of course the pandemic hit. And like many of us, right, we we're like, well, what is this going to bring to our organizations and our lives? And none of us really knew. And um, but what happened as the shutdown began is people started coming to our nature preserves. Uh, in numbers like never before. And imagine yourself with a little business where you've been trying to get the community to recognize you and support you for 50 years, and then all of a sudden, everyone comes to find you at one moment in time. <laughs> it was completely overwhelming to our entire team and staff. Um, but it was a, a wake-up moment as well. And I have to say, you know, the, the crowds, the people seeking nature, um, that is a good thing. Uh, but it hasn't really subsided, right? Even as things have begun to open up, our parking lots are full every weekend. Even in January, February, and March, you'll see places like Kelly's Run, Shanks Ferry, Clark Nature Preserve, those parking lots are relatively full all year long. And so we realized at that moment in time, we had to launch this campaign. We had to move forward um, to, to ensure that uh, we all had places to go uh, and that we were able to sustainably manage those long-term. Uh, so we've already talked about the reasons why, but I want to kind of get down to uh, talking about the specific goals of the campaign. We've, we've already framed that we have a $21 million campaign. We have been successful in the silent phase of raising $17 million, so we have $4 million to go. Uh, we're incredibly blessed to be at $17 million. It is a huge success to be at that moment in time. Uh, yet we need to get that final $4 million to achieve the goals. And so three main buckets, as we call them, that make up the campaign. There's the protection component. That is what we do as a land trust. It is our number one priority and will remain our number one priority is to protect that land. The second component, which plays into what I was talking about with the pandemic and people coming to our nature preserves, is the restoration component. And that is making sure Sure that we have great trails that are safe for people to come and hike that don't erode under major storms which storm pressure is increasing that we have great signage on our nature preserves that we have the right infrastructure with parking uh, and all of that is not only to make it safer for you and I but it's to protect the ecosystems which are protecting us to keep them safe to keep them healthy and then there's the education 
It's the next generation, or it's the people like you and I that maybe want to get more engaged but don't know how, and we're, so now we're offering volunteer trainings, and that is really tied to Climbers Run Nature Center that we want to build out in a deeper fashion. And so I'm just going to go down through here uh, in a little greater detail about all three of those buckets. Uh, this is the protection. It's $11 million as far as the goal. I've already said it's the number one thing we do, but there's three ways, three strategic ways we go about protecting land. The first one is connecting existing protected lands. Whenever we go and look at a parcel of land that comes up uh, where we have an interested owner or something that comes up for auction that's mostly wooded, we're looking at its proximity to other protected land. Yes, our protected land, but what parks, what state forest, anything that's protected, it rates much higher. This is the section of the Susquehanna River, uh, which is a really large part of our focus, as you know, the Susquehanna River, generally speaking. This is Lake Aldred. And so at the bottom of the screen on the right-hand side is where Kelly's Run and Pinnacle is, and you work your way up to Tuck One Glen and the Clark Nature Preserves, and you see the preserves in yellow, which are recent additions to the preserves that we have, which are in green. And then the ones that are orange are on York County side. Uh, and they have been, they're marked coming soon, but they have now been acquired and are under our ownership and under our management. But we're continuing to try and protect in this entire landscape, both in Lancaster and York counties. And you're, you're talking about protecting little glens and beautiful streams um, that could be developed and could be turned into housing. And in, and in some instances, we've competed against developers uh, to acquire those lands. The second one is expanding existing nature preserves. This actually happens all the time. And this is Welsh Mountain, which is our single largest preserve in Lancaster County. And you can see the parcels that are outlined there. That started as a 900 acre nature preserve, and now it's up to 940 acres. And it's by small acquisitions. And this is happening all the time. It's happening in real time this week with a potential acquisition that's come up. But this is happening to all, in and around all our nature preserves. Most of our nature preserves started out as 50 acres and then grew over time parcel by parcel. So we're always constantly looking Looking to build and expand those out. Just so you know, on this one, there's an auction June 9th, which is next week, mm -hmm. and uh, it's two lots down in the bottom corner, and uh, they are building lots, and developers are just crazy for building lots right now. And so we are. Uh, yesterday in the newspaper uh, or online, you know, that's 10 years in the making. State Department of Conservation and Natural Resources has been working on that with Manor Township and other partners, including the Conservancy. There is a concentrated effort to bring more people to our community as far as outdoor and heritage tourism. And with that, there is more demand and more opportunities uh, to preserve natural lands both in Lancaster and York counties, which is what started to draw us into York. And here we're in Hellam Hill. Uh, which is two new nature preserves, Wizard Ranch on the lower side, which is a former Boy Scout camp, and then the, the larger one there you can see has been acquired uh, with multiple smaller parcels, including a 500-acre large parcel uh, that is now combined to uh, over 1,000 acres of na preserved land. And we just did a master plan for this site, which goes into the stewardship component, the restoration component, which I'll talk about. Uh, and we have another... Uh, exciting new acquisition which was just announced in the paper in the last month which is the one in orange there which is another 1100 acres we now have under agreement and Phil I think you probably want to expand on that a little bit and why we're working here in Helm Hills so diligently yeah so Fritz talked about the conservation landscape and the conservation landscape was designated by DCNR to be the municipalities on both sides of the river and when we did the PPL deal down on Lake Aldred between Safe Harbor and Holtwood, we acquired a lot of York lands. And initially our board said those York lands, we should try and find a York partner to take them because we're the Lancaster Conservancy, right? And so we tried with County Parks in York and we tried with their Farm and Natural Lands Trust and neither partner would take them. So now we're managing land in York. And then several other tracks came along over the years where there were opportunities and there was nobody in York willing to own natural lands in fee. And so that led us to send our trucks over there and to do planning with York County and then this area of Helm Hills. Uh, the water company took the large area there that is the Helm Hills Nature Preserve and they had that sold for development. That's actually Don Nicholas and the Marietta Gravity Water Company, which is Columbia Water now. And that was gonna be parcelated off. There was a subdivision plan for 100 homes on 100 acres and then the others were all subdividable. And so when I started here at the Conservancy, we took on that project. 
and it was three and a half million dollars. It was the biggest land acquisition we ever did, and it took two or three years to finance that because Lancaster donors don't necessarily like their money to buy land in York. But I will tell you the fact that the Northwest River Trail and the town of Marietta is across the river does mean Lancaster does care. And so over that time, then we added a six other parcels to that, and then came this new acquisition, which is 11 million now, 1,100 acres. And it includes a mile of undeveloped Susquehanna Riverfront. I don't know if you know, but that doesn't exist in Lancaster County. We have a railroad that runs the whole way, okay? And, you know, it doesn't happen in York County because there's a lot of private land. You know, people who own houses on the river and undeveloped. But this mile that, that is that little white strip on, next to the river, that's actually all part of this. And it's pretty amazing. And then there's a Cadoris Gorge that any of you are whitewater rafters that has over 1.3 miles of the Cadoris Gorge, which is a very steep area that people use to come down. And the Cadoris is York County's Conestoga. So we've been able to get a lot of support from York, from the York County government and so on to do this. But the board really does talk about this a lot. And I will tell you that at our last retreat, which ended up in January, they made a very conscious decision that what we want to do is we want to manage by landscape and by bioregion. Which means we're going to focus on certain areas at the exclusion of certain other areas. And it turns out that this river corridor, the River Gorge, is one of those bioregions and one of those landscape type projects. So just managing on one side of the river and having huge housing developments on the other side of the river doesn't really work. And so it is, it is the approach we're taking and it's why we're in York. But what we're doing is we're bringing more York support. So we're not taking Lancaster's money and just putting it over there. So we're working with York. We now have five York board members. And we will continue these opportunities because this forest here is the only remaining large forest in the triangle between Harrisburg, which is growing toward York, York, which is growing toward Lancaster, and Lancaster, which is growing toward Harrisburg. And this area is smack dab in the middle. It's a huge 25 and the next 50 years as to what it's going to be like to manage these properties long term and what our organization needs to be prepared to do financially to be able to do that sustainably long term. We've had huge, you know, the, the areas of the conservancy where the conservancy started were the lower Susquehanna in the Lancaster River Hills, places like Tuck One Gun and Kelly's Run. And I think everyone is familiar with some of the challenges we've had with Tuck One around parking and how popular that nature preserve is. So as it comes to restoration, we're investing a lot of time into planning. What we did in Helm Hills is we did a master plan. We brought in outside professionals. We did an entire master plan, engagement with the community, engagement with pl uh, political and elected officials to put a plan together on how to build out proper infrastructure to do that sustainably. We're now going to start doing the same thing in the Lancaster River Hills, all the way from Clark Nature Preserve to Kelly's Run, including Tuck One Glen. How do we manage this as one forest? How do we manage entree to it? How do all the trails work together? How do we do proper restoration? And that's where this section of the money is going to go to because, quite frankly, it's been loved to death. It's been overused. You're, you're using parking lots and trails that were developed. The trails were developed by the deer, and the parking lots were like two or three car parking parking lots that have been there since the 70s and 80s. And so we're going back and we're creating management plans that will allow us to do it sustainably, allow you to visit sustainably and people to visit uh, in a way that doesn't um, challenge us with the municipality. Access is forever. Uh, we're investing a lot in our stewardship team. And this is split into two two ways. One is capital projects. So in addition to the planning, then portion of this money is going into on the ground implementation once the planning is complete. And then long term endowment for the organization. We need to grow the endowment for the organization to be able to do this and manage this in perpetuity. So about half of that seven million will go into endowment. Uh, we want to exceed 12 million in endowment by the time we get there. Uh, that includes our existing endowment. Which finally brings us to that education and engagement component. How am I doing on time, Diana? We're good. Great. We're doing great. Um, which is $3 million to invest in Climbers Run Nature Center. And this is really the place where we can bring anybody and introduce them to conservation. It has the barn, as the film mentioned. It's got a pristine trout stream, pond, and wetland. It has access. So we're looking to build it out even further and, and have it as interpretive gardens, places where anyone can come and learn, where we can host events, where we can host trainings and workshops, and lots of school groups. So we're talking about expanding the driveway, creating um, opportunities for buses to pull in and stop and drop off kids, and we're, and we're uh, scaling with our engagement and educational professionals. And this is um, 
This is a big leap for our organization. We have always seen ourselves as a traditional land trust, but what we, what we have to recognize is two kind of major components. One, we need more people like you and I that are dedicated to being out on our nature preserves and helping. So we have scaled a large volunteer land steward program, which has grown to over 150 people in 18 months. And that's eyes and ears out on our nature preserves, helping our stewardship team. And they're going from basic to advanced trainings through uh, efforts that are happening here at Climbers Run. And then it's that next generation of users and donors. It's conservation education to us. It's always centered around what our mission is and what, it, what uh, the benefit is of protecting our forested lands. So there's the, the barn and kind of the, the hillside in front of there is where we're going to be putting an ADA trail and um, interpretive gardens and uh, out, an outside classroom. Here is a, a rendering of what it'll look like. We're going to do some upgrades and modernization to the barn, including an outdoor mezzanine there to look down over the nature preserve. This will be a great opportunity, a great place for us to host events uh, and donors, as well as a research lab for clean water. Uh, we're talking about building out more infrastructure. I mentioned some of those things already, but bridges over the stream. We want to make this accessible for everyone, all mobilities, to be able to access nature and the nature preserve. Um, this is the outdoor classroom. This is a viewing platform that sits right next to the Climbers Run stream. So anyone can get Climbers Run and a renovation there. We are going out and we're going to spend the next 18 months going out and, and um, writing grants to match those public funds or those private funds to leverage your dollars and make them go much further. Yeah. Thanks, Fritz. That was a great summary. So during the quiet phase, raising that $17 million, I've had the privilege of spending a lot of time with donors who had the resources to commit to a campaign like this and learning and listening from them about what motivates and energizes them. And it's been just really uh, energizing for me personally. You know, I never thought I could raise money uh, and never had a history of working in development departments. But when you, when you genuinely have a relationship with someone and they genuinely have a relationship with our natural world, that ability to connect investing in the natural world just a real winner. So, you know, I like to think of a philanthropic community because I've been on the receiving end of requests into several buckets. And we have the arts, which elevate our spirit, which are all human focused, which have to, important for a community like ours. You know, we have the human services themselves, those that are more needy and have opportunities for dealing with physical pain of humans and suffering that we all have. And then we have the education, which is always the investment in the next generation. But all three of those are all focused on the human experience, our own growth, our own need to relate to this planet. And really, there aren't many organizations that are focusing on the planet that allows us as humans, a part of nature, to be part of this community. And so what I've been able to do is like, who speaks for the birds and the bees that are in severe decline? Who really can talk about the larger landscape, except for us as humans who are willing to choose to do that? So when I'm selling an acre of land, and I'm gonna protect it in perpetuity, and it's gonna help contribute to the longevity of the human species. You know, we're doing that long view that I talked about in the film. And it's just energizing for people to give and energizing for me. And so it's been quite a joy uh, to raise that 17 million uh, outside of a couple of large campaigns like the Fulton and the Anby Barshinger, you know, Center. We're really the, one of the largest campaigns this community has seen. And uh, we're just delighted to come and share that enthusiasm with you here today. So with that said, you know, we're here to answer any questions either about the campaign, about the organization, anything that you guys uh, want to talk about. And uh, shall I just moderate or do you want to do this? Yeah, that's great. If, I'm, I'm just going to ask if you have a question. If you don't mind just saying it into one of the, one of the microphones and also your name. It just helps everyone watching in the live stream. Hi, I'm Brian name. Davis, and I'm with the Hourglass Board. Sorry, I was a little late, and thank you for presenting. Um, just have a question, um, I guess maybe from a, a county-wide perspective. If you have uh, any thoughts or concerns on some of the invasives that we're seeing coming in with with the environment in mind, and how you guys manage that at some of your properties. Yeah. And that could so, be vegetation, wildlife, any of it. I'll let you go first, and then I'll answer it. Invasives are a huge problem. We're seeing them along the Conestoga starting here in, the, in Lancaster City and moving uh, north and south and every single property in between. We're all battling them. Um, uh, 
our stewardship team is well trained, our volunteers are well trained, we're literally going through our preserves and attempting to remove a lanthus because of the spotted lanternfly, but because it's non-native, uh, multi-flora rose, um, knotweed, uh, Japanese hops, the list goes on and on and on. And we are, our effort as a stewardship team, as a managing, you know, 8,000 plus acres, is to attempt to work from the trails and the parking lots out to clear as much of those invasives as possible. And it's not necessarily that the invasives in all instances are bad, but what they do, of course, is choke out the natives and, um, and the habitat that we really want to reestablish. So they spend a lot of time focused on that and there's a number of different practices that they're deploying in order to do that. So we partner with other public land managers in using best practices. So for instance, Kudzu, as a result of climate change, is coming north. I don't know if you're familiar with Kudzu, but if you go to Southern Virginia and drive along the interstates, it's like green carpets. It covers everything, and basically it's an in one plant uh, in replacing a whole forest. And these invasive plants have shown up here in larger areas because of climate change, but they come where this, we are that public landowner. Thank you, Dave Hoshler. A question more to the campaign, really a two-part question. First of all, um, if I wish to make a gift, but I say I have a strong interest in one of the three areas, can I designate? That's sort of the basic, can I designate to education only, for example. The other, let's suppose a really, really uh, attractive land you thought you'd never had an opportunity. It's the best possible tract of land you wanted to buy. Uh, is there anything, anything that prevents a future management of the conservancy from selling some land it currently owns that is developable to fund the purchase of the land you never thought you'd have an opportunity to buy? So uh, I'll answer your first question in a real simple answer, yes. We take all kinds of designated gifts. In fact, after I'm often meet with a donor, I ask which of these three, well, the three buckets aren't there, but if you move back a slide, which of those three areas, land protection, restoration, or education, you prefer? And so, some will designate. Uh, they just passion about kids and getting away from the screens, as an example. On, on the second question, uh, the truth of the matter is we often use and mostly use a state grant from a Keystone Fund, which is a fund set up from transfer taxes that grants money to protect land. With that comes a, 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 a conservation uh, easement that's attached to the deed, that that land can never be sold or developed, with the rare exception that if you do it, you have to do a conversion. And so you see this where the railroads will build a new railroad, they'll go through the wetlands, and they'll take the wetlands out of it, and then what will end up happening is you have to go create wetlands or, or protect wetlands other places. So conversions do happen. Uh, none have happened on our watch here where somebody came and wanted a bunch of land for some other purpose. Uh, and then last but not least, you know, the federal government and the state government have enormous power over landowners, and they can take by eminent domain. So we can't protect against that pipeline comes and wants to go down through a nature preserve, they use the federal government's power to come and basically uh, take and mess up the land. So there are those exceptions, but for the most part, that state held easement that's attached to every single deed that we have prevents us, meaning as an organization, from ever selling that land for any other reason except to transfer it to another conservation or land trust. Typically, it's about 50-50. So uh, a new land acquired is about half private funds and about half of that state funding that Phil's talking about, which comes with that enforcement. Thank you, Fitz and, and Phil. Thank you. Um, couple, these are, I guess these are kind of related questions, but just one. Is there a conservancy anywhere in the region or even the country that has been an inspiration to your planning? There's some other like best practices you're finding or being inspired by. And then the other one is has to do with development. Um, is there anything happening in the, in the country? Is it possible that some oncoming developments of like housing and such are, are more green or more conservancy oriented? Is that happening? Is it even a possibility in years to come where you could even partner with some of that development? Yeah. You want to go first on either one? Yeah. Um, I guess I... As it relates to state land trusts, we, we often look to natural lands to our east and, and look at what they're doing. 
and have a close relationship with them and can often call them up and we've gone and toured their facilities. They have 23,000 acres in New Jersey and Pennsylvania and all the counties north of Philadelphia up basically to the beginning of the Poconos. There. So obviously a much larger and, and more well-funded organization than ours, but great to strive to be there, right? To see how they manage their lands, how they've developed their facilities, how they do their education and outreach, what kind of programming they do. We've really picked their brains on all of it, and a lot of it has been translated in the programming that you see us doing yeah. here in Lancaster County over the last five years. They have about a hundred million dollar endowment where ours is closer to ten, just so you know. They were sort of funded by some of that DuPont money and some of the trusts out of Philadelphia money when they were originally set up. So they are about 20 years ahead of us. Uh, for your development question, I'd actually, uh, Linford is sitting back here. Thank you, Linford, for wearing the Water Week, the vintage Water Week shirt. Um, and I think of, I think of, um, yeah, the very first year, I think of, I think of Landis Homes. And, and there are great models out there, other great models of developments where they actually did all the proper best management practices and looked at the land holistically. Uh, they have, I think, a nearly five acre wetland that they have developed that we're gonna be featuring as part of Water Week on Monday evening. There's gonna be tours out there, which I neglected to mention earlier. Uh, but they were able to actually increase the developable land by doing proper uh, practices, best management practices for stormwater uh, and ecological practices up front. I think Rock Lidditz campus was also a successful model of that. And so when there is a development taking place, there are now examples in Lancaster County of the right way to do it. And that's what we'd love to see more of, a lot more of moving forward. So there's two, two separate issues here. One is that you, you know, 8,000 acres, Lancaster County has almost 550,000 acres, okay? You know, we can't make a dent in our ecological collapse that's happening. And we have to inspire property owners to do the right thing and developers and, you know, everybody and farmers to really make for sure that they're doing that. Our organization has looked at that, and I will tell you going forward into the future, I think there will probably be a shift over time that the land to protect probably will diminish, and the need to inspire everybody will increase as far as where we put our focus. Because right now we're putting it, most of the money and focus into acquisition for public benefit, but at some point we will do that, and we're dabbling with it. Right now we have wildlife volunteers through the National Wildlife Federation, and we certify people's backyards, and we have volunteers who do consultations on your properties. And they're out every day working in this community. Fritz can tell you how many of those we've done, but it's hundreds of backyards. And we really think that if we want to do this, we have to have pollinator carters that go across all this private land. We have to have inspired public works folks who own all the other parks and lands and the highways departments who get this message together. We just would welcome another partner organization helping take that lift so that we can focus on being a land trust. But that's a huge need in the community. Um, so. Yep. Um, I'm Joel Cliff with uh, Discover Lancaster, which is the county's tourism marketing organization. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, clearly, you guys have plenty going on in your day-to-day -day work, let alone the campaign. But I know that you obviously, as you say, have an emphasis on not only immediate, but long-term planning. And seeing what you're doing more and more on the other side of the river, I don't know if there's a similar organization, whether it's an exact match or not, already in York, but have, have you ever thought about, from a long-range perspective, of a name change that would incorporate the wider region such that the pros and cons of that with regard to people understanding that this is a broader issue that, that you're getting at and that just because money or organizational help comes from York or elsewhere, it doesn't necessarily, it's not a zero sum effort between Lancaster and York or, or what have you. I think at the point that the funds flowing out of York County to support land conservation or support this organization get closer to parity, I think we'll look at a name change. I tried looking at a name change about five years ago, and we did a survey with our Lancaster County donors, and there was just zero interest in a name change. <laughs> and the name change that everybody wants to switch to is something related to the Susquehanna, which brings to the second confusion, which is we have in Riverlands, they're charged with doing the visitor stuff, the marketing to, to ecotourists, and to, and, to, and to do that. And they're planning to build a big discovery center right there in Wrightsville. And so we've gone and let them collect the percentage of the hotel tax, like from York County, to help fund that marketing. And so as a result, they also didn't want us to use the word Susquehanna in our name. And so we got to a sort of a stalemate. Lancaster donors didn't want it. 
Susquehanna National Heritage Area said, we want to do the tourism piece, we don't want it, and so we basically walked away from that, but there will come a time. And it could be as soon as a $10 million donor from York steps up and comes to the table and says, you guys really should change your name. We want to invest $10 million in your organization and our board will sit up, look at that 10 million, and I would guess we would start the conversation all over again. I said probably not and we, we've had a lot of really great conversations with donors in York, and it's it's been kind of um, it's been it's been good to be the Lancaster Conservancy and go into York in a certain way because we've really tried to educate everyone on the fact that this the river is a connector, and that we're here to work with them, and and they've become more accepting over time, just as donors in Lancaster have. And certainly, we're moving in a direction where a name change will be eminent at some point, whether it's five or ten years down the road. But at this point in time, we're not getting a lot of pushback from the York donors, at least not to our face, and they're starting to really come around to the the time and effort that we're putting in. And you look at Helm Hills; that's the single biggest effort that we've ever undertaken. And it's in York County, and so they're they're seeing, they're having their aha moments as we continue to follow through on what we say we're going to do. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, Carol Litch. Hi, Carol. Hi. You're good. Uh, this is very exciting. I'm delighted to hear what you're doing. Um, we have such a crisis with housing in Lancaster, and I hate to see any competition among people who need homes and the need to preserve the land. My husband and I took a vacation to southwestern Texas and we toured one of these houses off the grid. And th these houses are amazing. They're built from all recycled materials. Uh, people take the rainwater off the roof. They recycle the sewage. Um, they do you know, electricity um, in a sustainable way. And it was really thrilling to see that. I had never seen uh, that. It takes a lot of energy also, you know, a lot of work to keep one of those houses going. Um, but I wonder if there's a potential to um, train people in how they might consider living off the grid so that they can, we can maybe do both things. We can have housing and also protect the land. You go, you go, <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, I, I, I think we have several things that are challenging uh, our housing crisis. Uh, number one being 64 municipalities in Lancaster County, we may each make their own roles and they just exclude housing options that might be, allow affordable housing in other places other than the boroughs and the city. And uh, you know, and then this, and they write all the rules for subdivisions, and they write all the rules of what you can permit or what you can't permit on all of our lands. And so, for conservation zoning, for instance, we have like 18 different conservation zoning differentials between the different municipalities here in Lancaster. Some allow a 10-acre subdivision, some allow a five-acre subdivision, some allow you to build a structure. Uh, like you're describing without permitting and some you know where the shacks appear out of nowhere and mobile homes and others don't allow that at all so it's just a real mismatch here it would be it will be challenging to do what you want to do and solve our affordable housing crisis that way but it is incredibly admirable where it's done and there's a community and they teach each other how to do it yep that whole Earthship movement is quite remarkable. We have a friend and a longtime board member who's been involved in that and been trained in it, and I personally think it's fascinating. We also generally don't look to protect land in the urban growth areas. So when we talk about development, most of the development we're talking about isn't the kind of demand for massive housing, at least in Lancaster County, because that most of that's happening within those urban growth boundaries, and generally speaking, the forested lands we're attempting to protect are, are off limits um, or outside of those, those areas. Yeah, uh, Adriana Atencio, the Commonweal. We're also very excited to be participating in Water Week on Sunday with the ride. Um, but my question is, has there been, well, I hear that parking is a huge pain. Uh, and is there any thought of like partnering with RTA or anything like that to maybe do a bus service to some of your more popular spots like um, Tuckwan or Kelly's Run on the weekends to encourage people not to drive, um, but to use public transportation? 
and to try and get you know fewer cars on the road, something like that. Yeah, I was going to say that. It, so I just think I don't know enough about our RTA, but it just seems like that they've really struggled with getting to long distances and kind of the infrastructure that they need to be able to do that. But um, we do dream of that. And we started talking with Joe DeVoy at Sickman's Mill about running shuttles. And he, of course, in his true entrepreneurial spirit, loved the idea. Take a shuttle from uh, Lancaster and go to Tuckwan. You have an afternoon, picks you up and brings you home. So yes. this is a possibility and we are actually talking about it. So. Yeah, I think he's got like four buses and he's already running from Telus to Sickman's and uh, has said, definitely said he would love to be running from Tuckwan back to Sickman's. And it's just a matter of, you know, the, the logistics of kind of managing that. And I think that that's that's probably a private entrepreneur is probably the, the way that that's going to come about. Um, and we've even talked about it ourselves. We just acquired our own bus to, um, to, to transport students from the city because transportation is an issue. So we've invested in that ourselves and we've, we've tickled the idea of could we actually do that um, as like a paid service. So it's, it's, a, it's a seed of an idea and um, it just needs to be kind of planted and expanded. That's a good idea. Yes, one final question, and then we're coming at the end of our hour. I'm curious, uh, you mentioned your goal is we're already protecting over 8,000 acres. Your goal is to move that to 10,000 acres. How many acres of natural lands are still un left unprotected in Lancaster County? And do you have any idea how quickly we're losing those to development? So Lancaster has the least amount of forested land in the whole state. It's 15%. Between 14 and 15% of our lands are forested. Now, a big part of that is because we're big, a lot of agriculture. So there's some factors in that. And they're counting some of the areas, like in Chester County, that are the subdivision. They're counting some of those areas with forests that somewhat about it. But uh, so we have to go where the natural land is available. And right now, the natural lands are in the Pennsylvania Highlands, which is the area that runs along the Turnpike in the northern part of the county. And then along the Susquehanna River, all the way from the Maryland border up to uh, Falmouth. And I will tell you, there's quite a few private properties there that score very high in our natural area scoring system. So we use a bunch of public databases that are all linked to ta tax parcels. We call it Linus. There was a slide about it, but we didn't get into the weeds on that, that identify properties that score above 80%. So we're measuring natural cover, water resources, proximity to other nature preserves, and some other things like that along trails and stuff. And we have quite a few properties. So I would say in total, there's probably another 10,000 acres, double what we have now that would be uh, would fit our criteria. In other words, they don't have a lot of expensive homes on them that have to be bought and, and dealt with. Uh, but, uh, you know, stay tuned. There's also a lot of sub farms in the southern end that are like not grade A soil, B soil, or C soil. They're like D and E soils. They're hardly able to be farmed. And we have the plain community moving down there and acquiring a number of these, putting animals out into all the seeps and the folds of the streams, and they're doing a lot of damage in trying to farm these lands. And so they're farming on steep slopes more than 11%. And then we have these rainwaters that happen and all of those, the, all that sediment and what existing soil is going down into the streams. And so I think there is going to be an opportunity here over the next generation to take a number of those lands and basically try to reforest them and try and make them ecologically a lot more uh, sustainable as opposed to uh, the other way where we're washing all the topsoil away and doing a lot of degradation. Great, thank you so much. Well, let's give uh, Fritz and Phil a round of applause. Um, of course, thank you so much for being here today. And then also incredible, already over $17 million raised towards the campaign. There's lots of opportunities to support the Conservancy this week during Water Week or with the Protect and, and Conserve, uh, sorry, I'm saying it wrong, Protect and Restore campaign. So um, please, we'll send out some information to everyone attended about ways that you can get involved. A video recording of today's talk will be available on the Hourglass website and YouTube channel sometime next week. So please share that with other people in the community who are interested in protecting our natural lands.
Uh, next month, we actually take off. We don't have a first Friday for him in July. Everyone's allowed to go on vacation. And then uh, we will come back in August when we start up again. And we're looking forward to doing our August first Friday forum presentation with our friends at Lancaster General Health and Wellspan Health talking about the community health needs assessment. So that'll be another really interesting presentation. Um, to get invitations to all of our first Fridays, please become an Hourglass member. You can do that on our website at Hourglass Lancaster. Lancaster.org. And until then, a happy first Friday. I hope